I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Can everyone hear me? So good afternoon. On behalf of the Department of Molecular Biology, Cell Biology, and Biochemistry, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Frank and Joan Rothman Commencement Forum, which was established in 1995 by, to honor the former Brown University Provost, Frank Rothman's career and contributions to Brown University. So Frank Rothman joined the Brown faculty in 1961, and his accomplishments here were many. Um, sorry, I'm getting a text in the middle of this. <laughs> Including teaching awards for teaching, uh, biochemistry, genetics, molecular biology, his role in founding our graduate program in molecular biology, cell biology, and biochemistry, which is still going strong nearly 50 years on. And Frank served as the provost of Brown from 1990 to 1995, further cementing his legacy at Brown. In 1995, um, then Brown University President Barton Gregorian established this commencement forum to honor the contributions to Brown made by Frank and his wife Joan. We're thrilled that our speaker this year is Francis Collins, and I'd like to turn the podium over to Dr. Leslie Gordon who will introduce Dr. Collins. Leslie is a professor of pediatrics at Rhode Island Hospital and the Warren Albert Medical School. She earned her MD and her PhD degrees here at Brown, and she has a long-standing scientific contribution with Dr. Collins, so Leslie. Good afternoon. Um, it's great to be here on, back on campus. Uh, in 2007, I was uh, privileged to be introduced by my progeria mentor, Frank Rothman, when I gave the Charles O. Cook Lecture here at Brown on graduation weekend. We've kept in touch, and we spoke yesterday about how excited he is that Francis is speaking at his and Joan's named lecture. Frank had actually a big hand in the formation and success of the progeria research that's brought us all here today. And although Frank isn't here in person, he is here by Zoom, so everybody wave. I don't know where the camera is. Hello, Frank. Um, it is my great honor to introduce Francis Collins, uh, leader of the Human Genome Project, longest serving NIH director, God bless him scientific advisor to the president uh, and author of best-selling books that delve into the relationship between God and science, just to name a few of his endless accomplishments. But uh, I think that the most important thing that you should know about Francis stems from a story. Our son Sam, who's here in the red, sort of with the with the Harry Potter glasses on. Uh, and my husband Scott and I met Francis and his spectacular wife Diane when uh, Francis was director of the National Human Genome Research Institute in 2001. Sam was four years old then and had progeria, and we asked Francis for his help. He and I talked one-on-one -on -one for a while about what was known about the science of progeria, which was pretty much almost nothing. And then we all played Frisbee with Sam in the yard, which was just an amazing time. Well, it turns out that Francis always carried with him the memory of a former patient of his who had a type of progeria named Meg. On that day, he met Sam carrying that memory of Meg. And Francis did something that changed everything. He said, yes, yes. I will help. Francis and Sam became great pals. A year later, he found the gene for progeria. In those days, that was a really big deal. I think it still is. Within five years, we had our first clinical trial. 20 years later, we have our first FDA-approved drug for the children. And now, 22 years later, we are still meeting almost weekly and we are still fighting together to cure each and every child. Even while the president is calling his cell phone, he never loses sight of Meg and Sam and every child he is fighting to save. 
So yes, Francis has a superb and beautiful mind, but what makes him truly great is his beautiful heart. Welcome, Francis Collins. speechless, obviously, after such an incredibly generous and personal introduction. And working with you and Scott on this disorder progeria has been one of the most inspiring experiences uh, of my life. And it, the inspiration continues because we still have a ways to go. But boy, it is a really exciting time right now. I'm glad to be here with my wife, Diane, uh, and also to have been able to take part in a lecture that carries the name of Frank and Joan Rothman, because uh, Frank was also a really important person uh, to getting the progeria research effort motivated and off the ground. I'm glad also that in the audience is Bob Goldman, who's been a phenomenal contributor uh, to our understanding of the cell biology of progeria, and particularly the protein, the lamin A, and the other intermediate fil filaments that happen to be the ones that play a role in this disorder, which also involves many other rare conditions. If I could get my slides flipped on, uh, that would be great. I hope that's going to be a seamless and easy effort as he watches the screen holding his breath. Thank you very much for that rescue. Much appreciated. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about uh, something you might call genomic therapeutics, and I'll focus primarily on this disorder of premature aging called progeria, more exactly hutchinson Guilford progeria syndrome. But I also wanna use it as a springboard near the end to talk about ways in which genomic therapeutics has the promise to touch on many other disorders as well. In many ways, what's happening right now with progeria could lead to advances for lots of other genetic conditions as well. I couldn't help, however, but start with a brief riff on the Human Genome Project, something which I spent 13 years of my life on and which turned out pretty well. And that was, in fact, an effort to try to make it possible to have a conversation like this about how misspellings in the human genome can cause illness and what we could do about it. Uh, this is me in 1995 uh, when I was a faculty member at the <coughs> University of Michigan, trying in that case to find the cause of cystic fibrosis. There was no genome project. Uh, there was no uh, really easy access to information about DNA. Uh, and so trying to sift through uh, millions of letters of the DNA code was really like trying to find a needle in a haystack. So I decided I need an image of it. Yes, that's me in a Michigan haystack. That's a needle I'm holding up in case you can't tell. And yes, those are real chickens. I just wanted to make a point here why we hadn't found the cystic fibrosis gene yet. Fortunately, we did by about 1989, but it was really hard. It took years and many, many graduate students and postdocs and going down a lot of blind alleys. So we had to do better than that if we were going to take that strategy and identify the cause of those thousands of diseases that we knew must be inherited because we could see that in families, but we didn't know exactly what the molecular basis was. And that was a major motivation for the Human Genome Project, which got its start in 1990. I was asked to step in as the director in the spring of 1993 and carried then through all of these many different phases of pro projects that we folded into this over the course of the next uh, 10 years. And happily, it all turned out. And by 2003, we had the first draft of the human genome, the three billion letters of our own DNA instruction book, and it made it vastly easier to be able to find the causes of genetic illnesses. The progeria was one of the hardest because it never had recurred in families, and so we had a lot of hard work to try to figure out where that misspelling might be. Just a small aside, we declared victory in 2003 for the sequence of the human genome because we had a draft that was pretty good, but we admitted it wasn't complete because there are parts of the genome that are really messy to deal with, they're very repetitive, and our sequencing methods, which are called short reads, just couldn't get across those. I do have to say, that has now been solved. And as of just about a month ago, we now really do have the complete sequence of the human genome. 
filling in the gaps, which are the red areas in those uh, chromosomes that you see spread out here across the cover of science. Those are centromeres. Uh, those are the short arms of the acrocentric chromosomes, which are mostly ribosomal DNA, but they're still interesting. And those are things that are near the telomeres, the tips of chromosomes, which are also difficult to sequence through. But now that we have so-called long read sequencing, we can do that. And so we can finally say with a straight face, we have finished the sequence of the <laughs> genome after having claimed it several times before. So all of this has made it possible for those thousands of diseases where we know there's an inheritance going on to figure out what the cause is. And if you look at the way in which the Human Genome Project facilitated that, it's pretty dramatic. <coughs> so that now here we are, and this is almost uh, up to 7,000 conditions where we know the molecular basis. For close to 4,000 of those, it's a fairly specific DNA change, a very subtle one that could, in fact, potentially be the approach that you might want to make for a therapeutic, but we haven't had the ability to do that until recently. So it's one thing to be able to read out three billion letters of A, C, G, and T. Those are the four letters of DNA, very simple alphabet. It's another to understand what you're looking at. And so we needed to invest in a lot of other projects to understand the meaning of all this, and also to understand the small amount of DNA that differs between people, which is only about 0.1% of the well-behaved part of the genome. So we needed to figure out how to help these folks who are trying to use the information at the bedside. And for that, a lot of other projects were necessary. And all the ones you see here got put together pretty quickly by teams who agreed to work together and make all the data accessible to enhance our ability to use the genome for beneficial purposes. And that has made it to the point now where basically anybody who's working on a project in human biology takes for granted that we have the genome sequence and a whole lot of other information about how it works. Graduate students today, I don't think, could quite imagine how we ever did anything without having that information immediately accessible. But what about therapeutics? I showed you that list uh, of that, that growing uh, bar of yellow bars of diseases for which we know the cause. How are we doing on therapeutics? What about gene therapy? Well, I think the bottom line is gene therapies, gene-based therapies are working, but it's taken a long time to get there. The treatment options, many ups and downs over the last 35 years, including some that have been heartbreaking. But improvements continuing to extend applications. Some of those are where you take the gene that's missing in that individual, you stitch it into a vector, you figure out how to deliver it to the right tissue, and that makes up for what is missing. That's been a godsend, for instance, to kids with immune deficiencies who without help are gonna end up dying of infections. And if you simply provide that missing gene an appropriate tissue, like their bone marrow, they're going to end up with a reconstituted system. But then there's other approaches, and I'll say quite a bit more about these, where you actually look at the RNA, which is what, of course, carries the information from DNA to protein, and see if you can block the production of something that's harmful. Or the third of these, and the most recent one, is that you actually go and try to fix the misspelling in the DNA directly, gene editing. And I'll say quite a bit about that, because there's a very exciting set of things happening right now with the disease that I'm here to talk about, progeria. Now, this has all led to a big increase in the number of therapies that are having uh, uh, approaches submitted to FDA. You can see that graph. That's good, but still, thousands of diseases really still lack treatment. We need an approach that could be scalable, where we didn't have to go after each disease one at a time. And I want to tell you a little bit about the way we're approaching this for progeria that I think has that potential. So let's turn to that. Most of what I'm going to talk about is this disorder, this rare form of premature aging, which is indeed rare enough that most physicians have never seen a case. If you ever have, you will remember them. I saw my first individual, and I didn't know how Leslie was going to introduce me, so this is an interesting connection. This is Meg, who I saw when I was a trainee, a fellow in genetics at Yale in the early 1980s and I was assigned her care. And she carried the diagnosis of progeria, although I think I could now say she has a variant of that. A uh, picture of her, she's in her early 20s. You can see she's quite small. And uh, she has many of the features that I'll show you more carefully in a moment of that condition. 
And she was an absolute character. Uh, small as she was, uh, with a high-pitched voice, she was often not taken seriously uh, by people around her. And she could curse like a sailor when necessary. <laughs> And I think she rather single-handedly made sure that the town of Milford, Connecticut, where she lived, uh, was going to have appropriate uh, changes in their doors and curbs uh, so that somebody of her sort uh, would not have trouble uh, getting around because she wanted to get around. She was a socialite, and she was amazing. And yet I felt, as her doctor, that I wasn't doing much to help her. I didn't understand the disease. I didn't know what to offer. There was so little written about it. And I filed that away as someday somebody should work on this. And then I met Scott at a typical Washington uh, event where somebody said, oh, there's this White House fellow. Um, and um, he's here doing a special year. And he has a child with a rare genetic disease. Uh, maybe you ought to go talk to him. And I went to Scott. And Scott told me, yes. Um, my wife Leslie and I have a child who's got the diagnosis of progeria, and I was absolutely flabbergasted because it is such a rare condition. And I said, well, okay, let's talk about that. And as you heard, uh, after a while, uh, we not only talked about it, we started strategizing. Uh, we were all a little younger then. <laughs> Scott probably took the picture. This is out in front of Diane's in my townhouse in, in uh, Rockville, Maryland. Uh, just north of uh, NIH. And that is Sam uh, at the age of four, carrying the diagnosis of progeria with much of a sense that maybe something could be done here with so little known about this. And I was captivated and agreed to try to help, as did others. So here's my shout out to Frank Rothman, because <laughs> I got to know Frank in that process as well. Oops, that wasn't good. I wonder if we have a. Uh, like a uh, weak connection here. Come back, please. Oh, we're back. We're back. <laughs> yeah, I think I know. It must be this one, Cable. I will not come anywhere near that again. So, so Frank, if you're listening, uh, your involvement in this, uh, your ability to help all of us believe that we could actually do something here was a big help in those early days where we didn't know anything about what the cause of this was going to turn out to be. So what is the disorder? Again, the full name, hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome. These children are born looking relatively normal. Notice the three photographs there in the upper right uh, being held in the hands of the individual whose pictures you're looking at. And then over the course of the coming years, have a serious growth uh, deficiency, so they end up really quite diminutive and short-statured, uh, but also begin to take on this aged appearance uh, with loss of hair, loss of subcutaneous fat, uh, skin that looks aged. Most significantly, though, they develop cardiovascular disease. And without treatment, the usual reason for uh, uh, losing life in progeria is a heart attack or a stroke. And the average age where this happens is in the 13 to 14 years of age. You cannot imagine a more heartbreaking situation because these kids have absolutely normal intellectual development. In fact, I would say, in my experience, they're rather precocious. And so here are these children who are growing and excited about learning things, and yet the clock is ticking loudly on their ability to survive. So initially, I started advising uh, Scott and Leslie about what might be done to try to recruit researchers to work on this. And after a while, I had a new postdoc, Maria Erickson, said, well, maybe we should just work on this and see whether there's some way to find an answer. And it was quite an education in human genetics about how that answer happened. Because again, this is not a disorder that generally recurs in families, so you can't use all the tools that we use for cystic fibrosis for this one. But running through all of that, here's the answer. And this was a Saturday morning I won't forget. Where Maria was looking at the sequencing of this region of a gene that we had some circumstantial reason to think it might be involved, but I don't know that we were that confident. And she said, guess what? All the kids with progeria seem to have this one letter change, this T, where there should be a C. See that right there? And um, that looks pretty significant. But then when I look at the coding of this gene, which is called lamin A, and I look at the reading frame, that still codes for glycine. So the biologists in the room will go, well, that's a silent mutation. That can't be causing anything. It doesn't change the protein. It doesn't matter. But it had to matter. 
because when we looked at the parents of these children with this disorder, they had the normal sequence. So this was just a de novo, a spontaneous mutation in that same base pair in DNA in multiple kids. That just had to be cause and effect. So how does that work? Well, it didn't take too long staring at the sequence to figure out what was going on. Because up there above it, I've laid out what is the uh, consensus for a splice donor. Again, those of you who don't know a lot about molecular biology, genes that code for protein don't code in one contiguous piece. They have these chunks of coding region called the exons. And then in between are introns. And there's a splicing mechanism that has to take the RNA that's being transcribed from this gene and splice it properly so you end up with the right thing that's going to code for the intact protein. Normally, in this gene, the splicing happens, as shown here, where exon 11 splices into exon 12. But this mutation actually makes a sequence which is a little bit better at a splice donor consensus, and it activates a splice site right there in the middle of that exon. So think about that. That says the RNA now is going to skip the last part of exon 11. That happens to be 150 nucleotides. That means that 50 amino acids are going to be missing from the protein that is produced from this. Again, a little biology 101, uh, three letters of DNA or RNA codes for an amino acid. So you're going to make a protein here that is fine up until that point, and it's actually fine right at the very end, because exon 12 is still there, but it's missing 50 amino acids near the end. Well, does that matter? Yeah, it sure does. And we quickly built upon the work that had been done by people like Bob Goldman, who had studied this protein. And thank God for that, because we were able to just step in and stand on their shoulders to understand what happened here. So what happened? And now I'm drawing you out the protein that gets produced. And on the left, it's the protein from the normal sequence. And here's where it gets a little complicated. Did you think you got DNA to RNA to protein and you're done? Well, not always. <laughs> Sometimes the protein has to be modified in what you call post-translational modification. And this is one of those that does that. So it starts out in the RNA codes for this protein that you see here. And then there's a trick that's added here, which happens to about 200 proteins. And this happens to be one of them, where you add this very hydrophobic hydrocarbon group called a farnesyl tail onto the very far end, the, the carboxy terminus almost, of lamin A. Uh, there is a signal here that says that's supposed to happen, the CSIM, and then you lose the last three amino acids. And then a final step is at that point, this protein is not done. It has to be processed with one more step, which is an enzyme that cleaves in order to release that hydrophobic tail. If you don't release that tail, you end up with a protein that sticks in a membrane, because that's what it wants to do with that hydrophobic tail. You don't want lamina to stick in a membrane once it's mature. As you can see on the right, what happens with that Hutchinson-Guilford mutation is the splicing abnormality has deleted the 50 amino acids that were necessary for that cleavage to happen. So you don't get that step. And you end up with the mature protein, which we call progerin, permanently uh, with that tail that's going to make it stick into the membrane. That is a bad thing for a cell that's trying to do what it's going to do. Because lamin A is a major protein of the scaffold that gives the nucleus its shape. Bob Goldman was uh, the first to really show in a very beautiful set of slides what that looks like in terms of, and this is an old slide, but I don't know, I have a better one, over 18 years. This is a nucleus of cells, in this case, they are fibroblasts from skin. And you can see early in passage, they haven't multiplied that many times, the nucleus looks pretty good. It's this nice oval appearance. But then after it divides more times, it starts to look lumpy and bumpy. And by the time it gets to passage 26, it really looks like it's in trouble. This is blebbed. It's very abnormal. Down below here is the western blot that shows you the presence of the protein. And there's that abnormal protein, progerin which is 50 amino acids shorter, so it runs differently on the gel. And it does look as if it accumulates over time, probably because it is very stable. It's insoluble, kind of like a rock in the cell once it's there. 
So this is the cell biology version of what's wrong here. Now, how do we turn that into something that could be potentially therapeutic? I'm going to skip this one and also then ask, does this matter to any of us who don't have progeria? Um, if this is a circumstance where you have a bit of this progerin, a lot of it, causing the disease we're talking about, do we make that protein too? Are you making it right now? I'm sorry to tell you, you are. Because that, that mutation, that one letter, that C to a T change, that activates that splice donor, that splice donor is not completely quiet anyway. We call it sort of cryptic. Here's an early gel that we did to look at that situation. And this is what you call an RT-PCR, which you all know about because of COVID. But in this case, we're not looking at a viral uh, sequence. We're looking at this laminate protein. And your primers, which you need for uh, RT-PCR, are here, one on the forward side, one on the reverse. So you're basically going to say, anything in between those primers, I'm going to amplify it, and I'll be able to see it on a gel. And you can imagine, if you saw something that had hit that abnormal splice, it would be shorter. So the two lanes here, H1 and H2, those are from progeria cell lines. But the other lines are from normal individuals. And if you look, you'll see there's a faint band in the same place in normal people. And if you cut that out of the gel and sequence it, it's progeria RNA. We're all making that stuff. You can even, uh, as Karima Javali did early on, make an antibody that only detects progerin. And you can show that in skin biopsies, particularly in older people, you can see that protein in the skin. So we have got a glimpse of something that is dramatic in these kids with progeria that's actually part of aging in all of us. In fact, without showing you all of the data to back this up, I'm more and more convinced that this is a switch that convinces cells when they're about done uh, with their normal ability to keep dividing to actually head for the exit and not hang around too long where something like cancer might happen because there seems to be a switch as cells go through multiple passages where progerin in normal cells comes on. And along with it, by the way, about 100 other genes that change their splicing pattern. There's a program here. So in this view, normal aging is not a running down of the system. It's an actual active program to tell cells, OK, you're done now. You can think about the evolutionary reasons why that might be there. Well, what are we going to do moving from that observation to try to do something for these kids? Because that's clearly our major motivation, having now found the answer, how do we do something therapeutic? Well, before you're going to try a therapeutic on a child, you first have to have a good animal model. Uh, so we created one. And this is, again, for the experts in the room, this is an animal model, which is a transgenic, uh, where we took a piece of human DNA, a big one, 164 kilobases, that had the human lamin A gene in it. But using a trick, uh, we engineered that to have the progeria mutation, which is here called G608G glycine, still glycine at position 608, but causes that splice problem. And then we inserted that into the mouse. And if the mouse has one copy of that, um, it is shortened in its lifespan, but it doesn't look too bad. If the mice has two, mouse has two copies of that, then it's small, it has a lot of the features of progeria, and it dies of heart disease early on. And you can see the life survival cord, uh, curves here. Uh, the black is a normal wild type animal. The green is a mouse with one copy of the progeria laminae, and the red is with two copies. A lot of the work I'm going to tell you about is done with two copies because you get answers quicker. <laughs> Those animals only survive to about six or seven months without treatment. OK, so we got the animal model. We know it's a laminate mutation. What do we do? How do we come up with a solution? Well, the first thing we did, and here, here are our options, of course, small molecule drugs, RNA therapy, DNA therapy. I'm going to walk you through each of these. The first thing was to say, is there some way we can dial back the amount of that toxic progerin protein? Because we know that's the bad actor. Well, just looking at the synthesis here, we don't want that thing at the bottom to be produced in large quantities. So could we block something about the pathway to get there? Well, farnesyl transferase is that second enzyme that puts on this farnesyl group, this hydrocarbon thing. 
So could we block that? Well, what do you know? We were fortunate in that several companies had developed drugs, pharmaceutical transferase inhibitors, thinking that they were going to be good for cancer. They were a bust for cancer, but they were willing to make them available for us for test purposes. And to our amazement, in the very first experiment done by graduate students, uh, just adding one of those drugs to cell culture to see whether it could normalize the appearance of the nucleus in progeria cells, it was pretty dramatic. So two different patients from whom we had cell cultures, one or two micro micromolar over 72 hours, and the very uh, abnormal looking nuclei end up looking pretty darn good. Okay, that's cell culture. What about our mouse model? I gotta show you a little bit about what we looked at specifically. Oh, in the mouse model <laughs> to be able to see. It'll come back, I'm sure it will now. <laughs> Just, there we go. Keep your hands off that. Um, uh, we looked specifically at the aorta in the mouse because we know that is a place in progeria where some of the greatest damage is done by progerin. Now, what I'm showing you is a microscopic picture of a mouse aorta. And this is a wild type, normal mouse. And what you can see, these green wiggly things, those are elastic lamellae, which are very distinctive uh, for the aorta. I'm not going to go further into them. But then the cells are lit up in other ways. Uh, so you can see where they are. And all those cells that you see in the medial layer are smooth muscle. They're really important for giving the aorta its ability to contract or, or relax. And in a wild type, you see lots of those. In the progeria transgenic animal, those cells are just gone. This is probably the place in the body where progerin does the greatest harm. And I can't tell you why exactly these cells are more vulnerable than any other, but they are. So what happens if you treat the mouse with a Farnesyl transferase inhibitor? Well, here you go. It was pretty dramatic, uh, seeing the result that you could see. We could even wait for the mice to get a little bit sick and then give the drug, and you could see that it stopped the progression and maybe even reversed it a little bit. So that's good, but that's a mouse. <clears throat> As people who work on mouse models of cancer would tell you, we've cured mice of cancer every day, but we haven't cured people of cancer nearly as often. Would the same apply here? So a trial was necessary. And here is where Leslie uh, swung into action and put together with colleagues at Boston Children's Hospital a clinical trial of uh, lonafarnib, a farnesyl transferase inhibitor, in the kids that you see here, including Sam, to see whether it would, in fact, provide benefit. And it was a tough question to decide. How will you know? You don't want to wait and see, does it actually improve survival as an endpoint? Although, as I'll get to, that's the most important endpoint. And eventually, we know the answer there. You want something you can measure. And so what ultimately was most convincing was to show that this drug improved the performance uh, of the major arterial tree uh, to relax what otherwise the stiffness that was resulting from the way in which those cells that I showed you were taking a hit. And so for these kids, you can see something called pulse wave velocity which is very abnormal in these children with progeria, with the treatment, came down, not to normal range, which is great for most kids, but significantly down. That was a very good indication of benefit. And subsequently, with longer follow-up, it was possible to show that this extends life, the black line being untreated and the dotted line being with treatment. And, as you heard, the first drug uh, for progeria was approved by FDA, uh, this drug, Monofarnin, that I've just been telling you about uh, in November of 2020, a little over, uh, about a year and a half ago. And virtually every child who has this diagnosis uh, is being reached out to by the Progeri Research Foundation, by Leslie and, and Audrey and Scott, to make sure that this is available and that they are getting treated. But it's not a cure, so it's no time to rest. What else could we do? There was another idea about a drug therapy, which is still a work in progress. If progerin is a toxic protein, which it clearly is, could we reduce it with lonafarnib, but could we also clear it more rapidly on what is still being produced? And here the idea is to use the part of the cell called autophagy that is the way in which you clear out uh, the leftover proteins that aren't helping you anymore, sort of the garbage collector. Could we rev that up? And that would mean using a drug called an mTOR inhibitor, which I don't have 
a lot of time to go into. Basically, we tried this in cell culture. It looked like it was actually looking quite good. Uh, we were able to show in the course of uh, doing a mouse experiment, uh, first a cell experiment you see here, uh, that this uh, did seem to improve the cell morphology fairly dramatically. So this is now actually a trial ongoing, uh, thanks to the Progeria Research Foundation, to see whether adding everolimus, which is mTOR inhibitor, to, to alonafarnib, the pharmaceutical transferase inhibitor, would give you an additive or even super additive effect. We don't know the answer yet. And the trial is underway. But now to go on. Getting closer now, aren't we? <laughs> to the real fundamental reason for progeria, that C to T mutation. We were looking at the protein. Now we're going to look at the RNA. Remember, the problem is we have RNA that codes for progerin because it's used that abnormal splice. Could we stop that? Can we make that splice not happen? Well, let's try. And here's an example that we carried pretty far about how that might work. If you look in the upper left, uh, even though it's a little small, I hope you can see sort of the idea here, is that you want some kind of a nucleic acid that you can block that abnormal splice so that the splicing system can't see it anymore. And then it'll use the normal splice. So what's that thing you're going to use to block? Well, it needs to be able to do base pairing uh, with the RNA. So it's another RNA. It's a morpholino is the version that we've got. And it's actually modified so that it's pretty good at getting into cells, even in, in a live animal or a live human. So that was the idea. But then we had to figure out, is it going to work? Uh, so we made a whole bunch of these morpholinos. That's what each one of those green lines is. And we spaced it across the abnormal splice mutation to try to see where did you get the best benefit, because we didn't know. And in fact, we found there was one right there in the middle that greatly reduced the amount of progerin. Again, this is in cell culture. And therefore, would be predicted to be beneficial if you could get it into cells in a live animal or a live person. Well, how are you going to get it in to the aorta? I mean, this is nice. I'm doing this in a cell culture growing in a Petri dish. How are you going to get that into the aorta? Uh, we had a system to be able to look at that. We had colleagues uh, at the company called Sarepta We've made some modifications in terms of how this kind of morpholino might be cell penetrant. And we did a quick experiment that was really quite exciting to see. And this was intravenous administration of this morpholino. This is not for progeria. It's sort of a, a molecule that we can track where it went. And, and basically, we're able to show actually quite good delivery uh, to the vascular smooth muscle cells of the mouse aorta. So we're ready to go. So where are we with that? We have now treated uh, mice with this RNA, this morpholino, this RNA treatment, uh, twice uh, weekly, intravenously. Watch closely to see what would happen. And here's what happened. The red is the animals treated with a dummy injection of saline. The black are the ones that got uh, the twice weekly intravenous infusion of this morpholino called SRP2001. Survival extended by 62%, which is really much better than I had reason to hope for. So we are pretty darn excited about that. And this is now on the path towards trying to get to a human clinical trial. And let no one think that that's a simple path. You may have really nice animal data like this, but you're talking about giving this to kids over a lifetime, because this isn't a one-time deal. You've got to keep giving this. So what's the path forward? First of all, it's not practical to do this intravenously twice a week for the lifetime of children all over the world, because many of the kids with progeria do not live in Boston, where they have easy access to the world's uh, most amazing uh, medical support. So how are we going to do this? Giving it sub-Q would make a lot more sense. And we're in the process of trying to make sure that if you do that, you still get equivalent pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. You've got to worry about possible drug interactions because all the kids are on lonafarnib, but you're not going to take them off. So you want to be sure that this doesn't interfere. I guess would be if anything that ought to be beneficial because it's synergistic in a very different pathway. You've got to know, is this toxic? You're giving uh, this kind of compound. Um, where does it go? It goes to the kidney. Does it do harm to the kidney? Uh, lots of studies already done with other morpholinos, not for this disease, but we've got to be sure uh, we know what that risk is. Putting all that together, we would hope to apply uh, pretty soon uh, for FDA approval to initiate a phase one trial. 
I'm glad that Dr. Rick Kuntz is here because one of the things that we need help with, and he and his uh, company Medtronic may be able to help, is how do we deliver this sub-Q formulation? Because it turns out in order to get a sufficient dose, uh, it takes about three milliliters each time you give this. That's not something you can give a single uh, injection to a progeria kid, uh, too much volume. But if you had a pump, uh, as people are using for other purposes, it might be just the thing. So Rick, thank you for this, and congratulations. Your son is graduating today, and you're here. It's a real treat to see you. Okay, that's the RNA approach, but now uh, let's go even closer, in fact, right to the heart of the fundamental reason why progeria happens, that C to T mutation. And could we actually be bold enough to just try to fix that in multiple different cells in the appropriate tissues in a child who already has the disease? Now, for me to have said that to you 10 years ago, I got laughed out of this auditorium because it would have been considered utterly, utterly inappropriate. But some things have come along since then. And a big one, of course, is this amazing system of CRISPR-Cas that allows you to zero in on a very specific place in the genome and make a subtle change. If you haven't heard about CRISPR, uh, you must have been living on another planet because everybody's talking about it these days. Let me just show you a very cool uh, animation of how it works. So I'm going to show you, in this case, this is CRISPR-Cas which comes in and makes a cut in DNA, but it's a cut that's guided by what's called a guide RNA, which has to match precisely that part of the DNA sequence in order for the reaction to occur. So here we go. Uh, that's Cas9, the big uh, bulbous uh, kind of protein, and it's carrying that guide RNA, sort of dimly seen there, and now it's latched onto its target. And the red is that guide RNA, and it's matching pretty well. Actually, it's matching perfectly. So now Cas9 is cutting the DNA in that very precise place, not touching anywhere else in the genome. Now you've got a cut, and the cell has to figure out what to do to repair it. So the usual approach here is just you know find anything you can and put it in there. But oftentimes that's damaging. So this could well be a knockout uh, of that particular uh, gene. And that's what CRISPR-Cas9 initially was intended to do, knock out. Well, for progeria, we don't really want to knock out. We want to fix that C to T. We want to knock in. So here's where it gets really interesting. David Liu, who's an amazing organic chemist biologist at the Broad, has been trying to figure out how to take CRISPR and make it that precise, where instead of knocking something out, you fix a single letter. And one of the first ones that he made work uh, is this one, which is a strategy that changes an AT to a GC. Um, and of course, that's what we need. <laughs> we want to take that mutant T and turn it back to a C. And this is a complicated diagram, and I won't walk you through it. Basically, what he did was to take an enzyme, adenosine deaminase, and covalently link it up to Cas9. <laughs> he knocked out the Cas9's tendency to make a cut in the DNA. You don't want that. But basically, he uses this hybrid protein of Cas9 and adenosine deaminase and an appropriate guide RNA to go find a single nucleotide and change it uh, from a T to a C, which is exactly what we needed. So he puts this initially into cells using a lentivirus, which is an easy way uh, to put this kind of a gene into, in this case, uh, fibroblasts from kids with progeria. And the result is pretty darn gratifying. Uh, showing you here, untreated, these are from kids with progeria, so 50% uh, of the uh, nucleotides at that position in lamin A are a T, which is the mutation, and the others are C, because remember they have one normal copy of lamin A also. And then after 10 or 20 days of treatment uh, with this vector, that has dropped down uh, to about 10% or still remaining is mutated, and the rest of it fixed. And you can look at the protein down below, and you can see that the progerin, which was there quite visibly, is almost gone after the treatment with this vector. But again, that's cell culture. Uh, David uh, showed me that data. He happened to be at NIH uh, giving a talk, and I said, come on, we gotta go for broke here. <laughs> Let's see what we could do to actually see if we could cure this in the mouse. So here again, hard to know. If you were to infuse this particular gene editor driven by a viral vector, in this case we used AAV9, 
Could you actually get efficient enough correction of one single letter of the code to expect it was going to help? Really holding your breath on that. Well, look at the left side. This is basically saying what percent of the cells in four different organs uh, actually were corrected in a single infusion, one time, in a mouse uh, with this gene editing apparatus. And it was, well, you can see the biggest uh, bars are for the liver, because AAB likes to go to the liver. And there you get like 65% of the cells have had that mutation corrected, which is astounding. And in heart, and in quadriceps, and in aorta, all places that we tested, it's also up in the neighborhood of 20%, which you think is worth uh, getting excited about. But really getting excited is then in the upper right, what we saw what happened to those animals in terms of survival. I showed you a previous survival curve with the RNA morpholino approach. This is even more dramatic in terms of the extended of life. Some of these mice after treatment are almost reaching the kind of age you'd expect for a wild type mouse. And it's kind of cool to look at the videos too. The untreated versus the treated, age matched in this case. Not hard to see the difference there in terms of what has been accomplished by a single infusion of this gene editor. So very excited about that. Uh, we did a lot of other experiments. Uh, we wrote a paper uh, published in Nature which describes the way in which this plays out uh, at the very detailed molecular level. And particularly looking at the aorta, the place where we were most concerned about being able uh, to get delivery and seeing that it works uh, remarkably well in that place. In fact, I will tell you one other thing that worked for us here, which I had really had the courage to hope for. If you're a progeria cell, your problem is you're going to senesce prematurely. If you've corrected 20% of the cells in a particular organ, the ones you didn't correct are senescing and they're going away. The ones you did correct are looking around going, oh, we need to divide and sort of make up the space here. So we actually, even though we had 20% correction in the aorta initially, after six months, we had 100%. Because the untreated cells had disappeared, and the treated ones had made up the difference. Now, that doesn't always work for you, that kind of in vivo selection. But in this case, it might be another reason why this has such problems. So I've said a lot about progeria, and I'm going to say a little bit more about the, where this goes in the longer term, but I'm almost done. I do have to right now, though, say a lot about a big shout out to all the people that my lab and I have been able to work with in all the experiments I've been telling you about, and many others as well. I've been fortunate ever since I came to NIH in 1993 uh, to run a research laboratory continuously, including while I was NIH director, and now while I'm the uh, acting science advisor to President Biden. Uh, these are very independent-minded people, and they don't wait for me uh, to look at their data before they design the next experiment. But they do know that I'm accessible at any time and totally willing uh, to jump in and deal with problems that arise. And it's an amazing group that's accomplished an awful lot. And we've only been able to do this because of collaborations with people like David Liu, like the folks at Sarepta, the people at Beam Therapeutics, and most especially with Leslie Gordon and the Progeria Research Foundation, because we couldn't have done any of this without that link uh, with the clinical capabilities and the way in which she has been such a hero for all the families and all the kids with this. So where is this going as far as the future? I just want to finish with that. Remember this diagram? This was, uh, in many ways, a sign of great success. All of these conditions for which we know the cause, so we have an accurate diagnosis. But you don't want to stop there. How many of these actually have an effective treatment? It's only about 500. There's a huge yawning gap here between diagnostics and therapeutics. So progeria actually would be one of the ones where we'd say, we have a therapy. So even though we have a therapy, it maybe is not what you really want, which is a cure. So the, what about the thousands of others? Clearly, we got work to do. Here's where I think. I'm particularly hoping that our experience with progeria is going to have even broader significance. Because you saw what we're trying to do there. We're trying to develop a therapy which could be generalized to other conditions, where you take a very carefully designed gene editing apparatus that's going to zero in on that very specific mutation and whatever disease you're interested in. And then you've got to link that up with a delivery system that kind of has the right zip code 
for the tissue where you want this to go. That's a big challenge, getting that whole array of vectors with appropriate tissue zip codes. But that is something that could, in fact, be achieved. And NIH is deep into that with a program called Somatic Cell Genome Editing, which, as you can imagine, is exactly this. How do we come up with ways to generalize what I just told you about for progeria? Bringing together the experts in editors and the people in targeted delivery, not just with viruses, but also with things like nanoparticles, to figure out how we could do the delivery part of this. And they're very actively in the business of trying to expand this, uh, just issued a whole bunch of new opportunities for applications uh, coming up in July. Another part of this that I'm excited about, which I think can play a pretty important role in things like this, not just gene therapy, but other areas where we have unique opportunities to move translational research forward at a more rapid pace than would otherwise happen. And that's ARPA-H, this idea of taking what has been done for decades uh, at DARPA and the Department of Defense and applying that same culture, that same attitude to specific projects in health where you want boldness uh, to be the way in which you go forward. You want to identify partners and projects who might never write an NIH grant. You want to have rigorous milestones and you want to be ready uh, to pull the plug when something fails and you expect to fail a fair amount of the time. That's what ARPA-H is about. Will ARPA-H play a role in gene therapy? I'd be really surprised if it didn't, but it also will in lots of other things. And I'm excited to see this has now been funded by the Congress uh, in the process of trying to help set that up and identify the first inaugural director, something that I think we may be fairly close to in the coming uh, weeks or months. So watch that space. But I want to finish by bringing it back to what really matters here. We talk about big, exciting science, and I probably one of those people who gets most excited about such things. But in my own experience, really what matters, it comes down to the one-on-one -on -one experience of trying to help somebody who has an illness that needs attention. And so I come back to Sam, uh, who did become my good friend, uh, whose wisdom far beyond his years, uh, I think influenced a lot of people who had the opportunity to see the HBO special, The World According to Sam. Uh, where you were able to understand from his perspective just what really matters in life and how you basically deal with things that weren't the way you would have planned them. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, Sam and me and, yeah, that's Cookie Monster, and, and, a, uh, <laughs> and a Ted Med gathering. So I just want to finish with a quick video, uh, which includes <laughs> Sam and me, because at that same Ted Med, I was supposed to talk about what do we need to do to really activate research and to push it faster. And I thought, well, I could talk about this, but how about I invite Sam uh, to come and join me on that? He skipped school that day, which is not the sort of thing that Sam usually does, and uh, flew down uh, to Washington uh, to do this at the Kennedy Center. And I will not forget uh, that particular experience and the way in which he, in the most thoughtful way, in the most inspiring way, talked about what research needs to do. So here's Sam's message to researchers. So what would you like to say to researchers here in, uh, in the auditorium and others listening uh, to this? What would you say to them both about research on progeria and maybe about other conditions as well? Well, uh, research on progeria has come so far in less than 15 years. And um, that just shows the drive that researchers can have um, to get um, this far. And it really means a lot to myself and other kids um, with progeria. And it shows that if that drive exists, Anybody can cure any disease, and hopefully progeria can be cured um, in the near future. And so we can eliminate those 4,000 diseases that uh, Francis was talking about. Excellent. <laughs> I miss Sam. We lost him a few years ago. But the way in which uh, Leslie and Scott and Audrey and all the other people have continued to work on this with unflagging energy is the best possible way uh, to honor his memory and give people hope. Because I think that's what we're all looking for, those of us who are struggling to find answers uh, for ourselves, our families, or for people who are out there suffering for whom our research might help. We, when we want to offer hope. But hope isn't just one of those things you throw around carelessly, I don't think. As Peter Levi says, it's a privilege. It attaches to action. No action, no hope. Frank and Joan Rothman believed in that uh, and practiced that particular approach to everything they did uh, here at Brown. 
it's a privilege for me to be able to be here speaking at a lecture with Frank's name on it, and to do so with full realization that almost everything that we do in the course of life depends upon hope and how we can personally make that hope happen for those who are still waiting. Thank you so much for the chance to speak with you. Probably some people have to run. If there are people who want to stay and ask a few questions, I'm willing to uh, listen to those questions and do my best to answer them. But I will not keep people here who have other uh, details because I know I, as usual, I kind of went on a bit, but I had a lot I wanted to say. So yes, questions? <laughs> Well, the real expert is Leslie Gordon sitting here. I think Leslie would say if you really had a high level of suspicion, you might be able to diagnose this at birth, but nobody ever has a high level of suspicion because this comes out of the blue. So generally, it's a few months before people begin to say something's not right, often because of growth deficiency. But then other features start to appear, the loss of hair, the change in skin. And usually, by the time the child is a year old, it's pretty possible. And certainly by two years, most kids have been diagnosed. But that's great news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. I was just wondering why lamin AC needs to be um, for nestle transferase. I mean, it seems like that point is just like an extra step that doesn't really accomplish anything. And so, like, how does this like help in terms? That's a great question. I will wave my hands and then I'll ask Bob Goldman to say what the real answer is. I think, think of it this way. This is a protein that needs to find its way to its appropriate location, which is underneath the nuclear membrane and the nuclear scaffold of a whole lot of other proteins. And in my simplistic view, that Farnesyl tail is part of the zip coding that enables that protein to go to the right place. But once it gets there, you want to get rid of it because the scaffold needs to be fluidly able to move underneath the nuclear membrane, and now it can't because it's stuck in that space. But yeah, if somebody gives Bob the microphone, what is the point of that Farnesyl tail, Dr. Goldman? Can, can we pass the microphone down? It's coming. It's coming. Nobody really knows. <laughs> It's fascinating, <laughs> but remember that lamin B is permanently unacetylated and it's always associated with the nuclear envelope membrane. Yeah. And that lamin A only is expressed later in development, not mm -hmm. in very early development. That might be a clue, I just don't know. But I think one of the things I wanted to ask you why I have this. <laughs> <laughs> you look at the nuclei in the, in the cured mice. In the tissues, I mean, that became normal, like the blood vessel walls, yes. et cetera. Yes. Did you, did you look at the nuclei to see if they look normal? They look normal. Okay. They, for all purposes, look as if they're just back to being a wild type cell. It's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is indeed. <laughs> Up here, yes. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have kind of a wild question. Um, Bring it on. <laughs> So I've been reading about some interesting research at Harvard. It's, it's kind of, I don't know if you've heard about the professor, uh, David Sinclair, by any, by any chance. But, um, no, but if it's Harvard, it's got to be weird. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty weird stuff. So um, from part of my understanding, I understand that DNA damage can lead to aging, if, if I'm understanding that correctly. So in theory, if you're able to sort of, in the future, repair that DNA damage, do you think that if you were able to do that, one day it could be possible to kind of repair like the aging process in humans? That's uh, not an odd or weird question at all. There are a lot of people trying to figure that out. 
And what's the connection between DNA damage and progerin? Actually, I didn't tell you that, but if you do an experiment to damage DNA in a cell, it tends to turn on progerin. It's basically the cell probably signaling through P53 saying, oh, this is not a good thing. <laughs> if we have this much DNA damage, we might be on the way to being cancer. We better just basically senesce and get out of here. But no, they're all in there connected. The other part of this is telomeres, the tips of those chromosomes. When they get shorter and shorter, that's a sign of aging. When telomeres get really short, that turns on progerin also. All of this fitting together that there is this program that's very deeply embedded, probably in all life forms, but certainly in mammals, uh, to make sure that there is a limitation to how much you're gonna allow itself to keep replicating before it's time to say goodbye. Great question. Thank you. Ah, yes. Hi there, great talk. Um, I'm just curious about the sort of systematic or system-wide impacts of progerin accumulation and why that doesn't happen in, um, like the brain, for example, you had mentioned that you know, people with progeria don't have any kind of cognitive defects or anything like that. Um, is there more damage in tissues with like higher turnover rates or? Another great question. When you look at the brain, uh, it looks as if the gene is transcribed and the RNA is temporarily there. But if you know about microRNAs, the brain has a very tissue-specific microRNA that shuts down lamin A and keeps it from getting translated into protein. So there's very little lamin A in the brain, which is probably why the brain is protected uh, against the disease. Lamin A tends to get expressed later during differentiation. Um, so that maybe explains a little bit the differential in various tissues, but I, don't, I mean, the liver makes tons of lamin A, and yet there's no progeria phenotype in the liver. I don't know why. Uh, adipose tissue makes a lot of lamin A, and it's profoundly affected in progeria. Kids with this disorder really have a lipodystrophy. Their, their subcutaneous adipose is gone. So more mysteries. Maybe Bob can answer that one. <laughs> uh, uh, no. No. <laughs> You're crying. <laughs> yes. I was wondering uh, where we stand with the safety and efficacy of viral vectors such as AAV9 and where you see they may be useful in the near future. Another great question. So AAV9 has been sort of the most widely used and it's particular um, uh, exciting advent was, of course, the treatment of the disease spinal muscular atrophy, uh, a terrible recessive disease where children with this condition kind of have a disease like ALS, except they have it within a few weeks after birth and die by age year and a half. AAV9 as a vector to deliver uh, the appropriate gene to the um, very otherwise inaccessible cells in the spinal cord works like an unbelievable miracle. And some of those kids are now five years out and seem to be doing really well. So in terms of humans, it looks as if AAV9 in the doses given in that situation is probably looking to be pretty safe. But we do worry that AAV9 has been associated with liver tumors. The mice that we treated, that we got that fantastic result in terms of extending longevity, when they finally died and we looked at them, they did have liver tumors, probably a result of AAV9 integrating somewhere in the liver genome. And that's not good. So there's lots of interest, of course, in trying to find other alternatives, or also to cut back the dose that you have to give, because some of these doses are pretty high. There's lots of other AAVs that are people looking at to try to see what, how you could do that zip coding and, and achieve the kind of safety. A lot of other people would like to see us getting away from viruses to other things like nanoparticles that don't have that same potential risk. But it's very much a field in flux. Unfortunately for us, trying to design how we're going to treat children with progeria, if you're going to jump into a totally different AAV that's never been used in a human clinical trial, you just bought yourself a whole lot of time. So it's very much compelling to say, let's go with AAV9. It worked in the mouse. It's been very successful in SMA. Yeah, there are these issues about whether there might be liver risks, but we haven't seen them. Uh, in the kinds of situations we'd be talking about. Ultimately, 10 years from now, I doubt if we'll be using AAV in quite the same leading way that we do now. People will come up with other alternatives. 
I personally would love it if a lot of them were not viral, uh, but there were other kinds of delivery systems that don't carry that risk of, of genome integration. I have a, a liberal arts question in case you didn't know. We're a, obviously a liberal arts institution and a medical school here. And having worked at the NIH under your leadership for the last 30 years, I want to pay you the ultimate compliment, which is how did you become the one in a billion clinician, scientist, and administrator leader uh, given the behavioral and inheritance of behavior? Can you? Look inside yourself and tell us how somebody can, can minutely understand the human genome and manage, in the most turbulent times, the NIH. Do you have any insights into <laughs> genetics, your background, your family, your homeschooling? You know, we need more of you, Dr. Tom. I think it's mostly because I'm married to the right woman. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, you know, I, I was fortunate uh, to grow up in a family where learning new things was the most exciting thing you could possibly do. I didn't go to school until the sixth grade because my mom and dad taught me at home. Uh, not that they were particularly interested in religious indoctrination because they weren't people who cared about faith very much. But they thought that their four boys, of which I'm the youngest, would get off to a better start in life uh, if their early education involved just the most remarkable moments to expand your intellectual interests and, and chase after things because they were interesting. And so lesson plans, well, we didn't really have those. <laughs> it was, okay, what's interesting today? Let's pursue that until it's not, and then we'll try something else. And that was such a gift. And I carry that with me every day, this sort of interest in something that I don't know anything about and how you could use that to try to make the world a better place. So yeah, I give a lot of credit uh, to other people, not to myself. And there are a lot of other folks who have done amazing scientific things and who also have done administrative roles that are pretty darn impressive. I just happen to have had doors open that I never counted on and tried to walk through them if they seemed like the right ones. But that was a very generous question. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> be a good place to sort of wind this up. <laughs> I don't think it's going to get better than that. <laughs>